Welcome to this session. I, I'm really privileged to moderate the panel, which is called on the agenda, the economic and legal empowerment through the robust rule of law. I work for the Open Society Justice Initiative. I'm based in Budapest. My work is global, and this topic is very close to my heart. So I'll do my best uh, to uh, keep this uh, session interesting and kind of really uh, challenging and enjoyable uh, discussion for all. Um, I was uh, asked by the organizers to uh, uh, leave sufficient time for the questions and answers. So uh, hopefully, uh, that's my at least the aim, that uh, we'll, we'll spend about 45 minutes uh, in, a, in this an hour and a half session to uh, have a discussion in the panel, among the panelists on this topic. And afterwards, uh, we would leave another half of this uh, session for questions and comments so that all of you are engaged uh, in the discussion on this topic. In 2000, the responding to the world's, really the, 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 the most important development challenges, um, the MDGs were adopted to address uh, extreme poverty and respond to the questions of gender inequality, you know, the, the promoting education, health, and aim at combating uh, you know, the, the child mortality, maternal um, and improvement of maternal health and addressing other major diseases. The MDGs did not say anything about justice and rule of law. They were, they were missing, uh, disappointingly missing from, from the final document which was adopted. On, it, is, it was disappointing, but at the same time, it probably indicated uh, the failure on, uh, on, on the side of many of us, perhaps, and the people committed to justice and rule of law uh, to, to make strong enough case why justice belongs to the development agenda and why it should be included. So in the past five years, things have been changing. There is a the growing recognition of, of the intrinsic connection that law and justice have on development. I think the, the, the most important statement in this regard was made by the Legal Empowerment Commission in 2008, which published the report, How to Make Law Work for Everyone. The board, the panel, which, was consi which consists of many eminent persons, said the following thing. Four billion people around the world are robbed of the chance to better their lives and climb out of poverty because they are excluded from the rule of law. Lack of legal power and protection is a major reason why people fall into and, re and remain in extreme poverty. This was a very strong statement. Uh, and also because it not only described the reasons for, for poverty and other uh, developmental issues that remain unaddressed or un unimproved, but uh, also because it actually provided a vision on how actually one could make rule of law work for people, and they put forward the, uh, the, the concept of legal empowerment as a tool which can actually enable people claim their rights, make rights work, hold governments to account, and actually ensure that all the other important development objectives can actually be realized for all people um, uh, globally. Since then, there has been, a, uh, again, as I mentioned, a growing recognition of this topic. Uh, last year, there was a UN um, session devoted, uh, at a high-level session devoted to the question of rule of law. And this year, uh, just a few weeks ago, at the end of May, high-level panel of eminent persons uh, for the post-2015 development agenda published its r report uh, that is going to shape or advise the UN process for developing the next generation of MDGs. I also would like to quote what they said in this regard. Five transformative shifts are needed to meet the new 
ambitions. And one of them, they believe, in, in this five is, the, is uh, to build a peace and effective and open and accountable institutions for all. Peace and good governance are core elements of well-being, not optional extras. New agenda must tackle causes of poverty, exclusion and inequality. People around the world want their governments to be honest, transparent and accountable. Personal security, access to justice, freedom from discrimination and persecution and violence in the decisions that affect their lives are development outcomes as well as enablers. Capable and responsive states need to build effective and accountable public institutions that support the rule of law. So I, I think uh, uh, you know, the panel that uh, has been composed by the organizers, and I should commend them for uh, choosing the panelists uh, uh, in this composition, uh, is, the, is, the, is, the, is the fantastic, uh, you know, the opportunity to debate this question and really to, to, to address the questions of you know, how do we make sure that you know, the, the questions of justice and rule of law are you know, they're really fully recognized as, a, as, a, as an essential the parts of state building, uh, development, or any other, any other uh, the type of activities which addresses um, you know, the, the many development questions uh, globally, and in particular uh, with, the, with the upcoming uh, uh, creation of the new generation of MDGs. Um, what uh, I would like to briefly introduce now the panelists, uh, and then I will ask them questions, just a question, one question to each, uh, after which we'll have a discussion on the panel uh, before we open the discussion to the audience. I start from my immediate left. Uh, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Faustina Pereira, who is the director of uh, legal aid and human rights uh, programs at the BRAC, uh, the, the very well-known well -known organization from Bangladesh. Faustina is a lawyer and human rights activist who has been also publishing on this matter and uh, is, is doing this work in Bangladesh as well as globally. Uh, Yasmin Patiwalda, who has a long-term career and uh, experience of working in public sector, especially in the areas of uh, public health and criminal justice. Currently, she is leading the UK-based organization, the Advocates for International Development, which sources lawyers to provide support to organizations throughout the world, the main objective of which is to eradicate poverty. Steve Golub, a well-known uh, scholar uh, uh, in the field of legal empowerment. Actually, he coined the term of legal empowerment some 10, 12 years ago uh, when he published a study uh, that was supported by the Asia Development uh, Bank. He's been teaching on legal empowerment and development issues at the University of California in Berkeley, at the Central European University, and has been consulting with many international organizations on this topic. And Vivek Maru, who is the co-founder of the organization called Team Up for Justice, the Sierra Leonean organization, which was established in 2003 and has been recognized by uh, Transparency International, International Crisis Group, and many other organizations for the pioneering and innovative approach for addressing justice needs for the poor people in the country. He worked for the World Bank, the senior legal counsel, until two years ago when he founded a global organization called NAMATI, which is dedicated to building global movement on legal empowerment. My first question is to Steve Golub, as I started to mention um, about you coining the term legal empowerment some 10, 12 year, years ago. And about 10 years ago in your paper uh, on uh, rule of law orthodoxy, uh, or you challenged the uh, kind of the established frameworks and approaches to rule of law assistance abroad by relying or by, by really building your vision uh, on legal empowerment as an alternative to the rule of law orthodoxy. So after 10 years from 
publishing this paper. How do you think about the field? How has it evolved? Have we learned about how things work in practice and whether legal empowerment has gained the kind of recognition you were hoping uh, some t that 10 years ago? And maybe you can also describe how you understand what legal empowerment is. Okay, well, thanks. I haven't really thought about it much, so I don't really have much to say on this. But, uh, okay. <laughs> but in any event, uh, thank you, you have all. To say something now. <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you for that kind introduction as well. Uh, it's funny, whenever I hear myself described as, a, as someone used the term scholar or professor, I kind of look around and say, who are you talking to? Because I don't, even though I teach part time, it's not mainly what I consider myself doing, it's more of a practitioner. Nothing against any of the scholars or professors here. Uh, to, to answer that question, um, I'd like to start with a bit of audience participation, which I think uh, will be fun. And even if it's not fun, let's do it anyway. Uh, how many of in the group here are lawyers? Pl raise your hands, please. <laughs> OK. How many are journalists? OK. Uh, good for you. Uh, how many are <laughs> health professionals? Paralegals, educators other than law professors. OK, that's good. We need you people. Uh, okay. This is my point to try to bre begin briefly to describe what legal empowerment is. It's much more than simply being about law and lawyers. And uh, because often what, and I would argue that justice is often more about that, that what often brings about justice legal empowerment, whatever term we want to use in which law and rights are used to help improve people's control over their lives, the quality of their lives, the material, their material circumstances, can involve many other skills and features. Community organizing in, in some places. Um, uh, integration of law into helping and rights to help people, as Vivek pointed out in a very good article, to take advantage of medical services that might be available to them, even in a poor country, but that otherwise they're denied because they don't know that health professionals are supposed to be on the job, that they're not supposed to be charged or overcharged for certain medicines, things along those lines. Uh, the use of social media is a growing phenomenon. Investigative journalism can contribute to justice and uh, the rule of law and legal empowerment. So when we think about um, legal empowerment, it's not just about law and lawyers. It can and should involve many other perspectives, skills, and types of advocacy. Uh, I would hope that you know, if this were purely a legal empowerment uh, <coughs> conference, not that it should be, it would involve many people from other types of disciplines. I would hope that actually going forward, the World Justice Project and World Justice Forum Benef can benefit from bringing in people from various different perspectives. Other things you should know that I think you should know about legal empowerment is, first of all, there are still different perspectives on it, and you'll hear it represented on the panel here. I mean, even um, if everyone else here is wrong and I'm right, you should still listen to them. Uh, but there are, I'm kidding, <laughs> but there are um, different perspectives. It is an, an evolving field. But um, uh, the, the, Yet one key feature of it that distinguishes from what Zaza described and what I had called this rule of law orthodoxy is whereas rule of law orthodoxy is what's mainly being discussed at this conference, various ways of reforming laws, improving state institutions, it's mainly what development agency money is going into, um, focusing on state institutions and law reforms in hope that it will trickle down to benefit the poor and other disadvantaged populations. Legal empowerment is mainly about direct financial, and I emphasize financial, and as well as political support to disadvantaged populations and their civil society or policy institute allies, and to other genuine reformers um, who sometimes may be in government but aren't necessarily the case. You know, a typical, and I'm generalizing tremendously here, rule of law orthodoxy approach would be, let's see what we could do to convince the Supreme Court or Minister of Justice to move forward a little bit on improving, on battling court delay, or on, or on better court rules, 
or in adjusting some laws. Legal empowerment is about funding NGOs. It can be about funding press operations. It can be involved funding other civil society groups and research, but directly helping and enabling the poor and their allies to assert their rights, not just to go to court, but also work through administrative agencies such as land titling, or as I mentioned, to also try to assert their rights to um, education or health, particularly in instances where the money is there, but it gets bled off through corruption and, and um, otherwise gets uh, misused. Um, now, which approach makes sense? It, it, it almost depends on your theory of change or how you think the world works. Um, in my experience, you know, based on six years in the Philippines, I don't think simply training the police there on how to do their jobs better has done much good. Lots of police in the Philippines joined the force to be corrupt to make money to begin with. They don't start off as clean slates who are corrupted by the process. Based on a discussion with the World Bank's leading, uh, a former World Bank official who was the leading uh, authority on the Indonesian judiciary, um, uh, lots of top judges there pay huge bribes to, in order to get their positions to begin with so they can then extract bribes to even increase their incomes even more. An NGO called Global Witness, a good international NGO called Global Witness has documented how the very top officials and their families in the Cambodian government are involved in corrupt practices regarding the natural resources sector there. So I'm not saying that legal empowerment is necessarily the solution to all that, but I'm saying that rule of law orthodoxy with its assumptions about simply training and technical capacity building isn't necessarily the answer, and that's been proven, I think, in, a lot, in, the, in the form of a lot of unsuccessful projects uh, along the way. How has the field, so you know, the focus of the field is on supporting reformers, on directly supporting the efforts of the poor and the disadvantaged to both promote law reform and to get laws that exist on the books um, actually implemented on the ground. The field, I think, has grown to some extent over the past uh, decade. If you, you know, we came up with the term legal empowerment for want of a better term to try to generalize a whole series of initiatives that are going on across the world that try to focus directly on the poor and their allies and strengthening them. There's, it's not a magical term. World Bank uses justice for the poor. In the Philippines, where I spent some time, they use um, alternative lawyering. It's just a term to try to capture different types of approaches and an alternative view of integrating law and development. The progress is seen to some extent by the fact that more big institutions have bought into the work that smaller NGOs, or in the case of BRAC, not so small, but NGOs across the world are doing to various extents. You know, the World Bank Justice for the Poor program, the UN Development Program is at least paying lip service to this. How well it's playing out in practice, I can't honestly say. The General Assembly of the UN, UN has endorsed this, not that a UN resolution necessarily means anything, but it has gotten that kind of recognition. Hard funding from the Department for International Development of the UK and AusAid and other bilateral agencies is going into this type of work to somewhat more of a uh, great, uh, to somewhat of a greater degree. The Open Society Foundations, which is represented by uh, uh, Zaza here and also has a vibrant public health program, is focusing on um, uh, legal empowerment. George Soros likes the idea, and if George Soros likes the idea, that's a good thing because George Soros is an important guy. So there are various types of ways in which it's moving forward in terms of increasing support. Uh, I think you know the, the, the ways in which it plays out, I would hope, will include, as I mentioned, greater integration as we're starting, as we're only beginning to see of legal empowerment work into other fields so that when the poor and the disadvantaged prioritize getting medicines for their sick kids or getting their kids into school or otherwise being treated better by local government and having greater control over local government resources, I think the integration of law-oriented work into other development fields can and will be crucial. How much that will play out, um, uh, we'll see. The, uh, but, but I think that's a direction we're beginning to see, and we're beginning to see research to try to demonstrate the impact of this uh, mm -hmm. kind of work. I guess in closing, I'd say that some of the um, 
uh, ramifications of, of, for legal empowerment can be felt if the World Justice Project itself and, this, and, and the forum pays greater attention to it in the future, including integrated, greater, integrating greater legal empowerment priorities and concerns into mm -hmm. the, world, the rule of law index. I think it's, it's just, um, I'm trying to think of the kindest word. I think it's unfortunate, for example, that the rule of law index doesn't include great attention to gender considerations in what, whether a given country has a vibrant rule of law and, and other considerations regarding um, uh, you know, the minorities in a, in a given country. But I'll close on that. I hope I've given you a bit of a sense of what it is the, of the field and how it's evolving. And of course, welcome any differences of opinion and questions. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. And then there are a few points I would like to come back uh, mm -hmm. after the initial yeah. remarks, in particular on integration, integrated mm -hmm. approach, and how to achieve that. My next question is to Yasmin. And um, Yasmin, I wanted to ask you about uh, the, the, the problems of uh, uh, implement, implementation of rule of law or turning it into a practice which sometimes is, is explained by lack of evidence uh, on the importance of legal empower, rule of law and what, how it really makes, uh, helps promote developmental objectives, how you know, economic ones or others. And uh, my question to you um, is from, given the work you do, the, the advocates for international development, providing legal assistance uh, to the organizations which uh, engage in uh, poverty work, you know, can you share with us the, the kind of the observations on, on, on what you've seen in the field, how important this has been for, for, the, for the individuals, for vulnerable in, or any uh, uh, who are left, uh, you know, in many societies, yeah. Uh, thank you, Zaza. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just to also say I'm delighted to be here and to thank the World Justice Forum for inviting me to contribute to this panel. Zaza, your question is a very helpful one as it enables me to talk about the work of A4ID, which I'm going to do also in the context of the wider purpose of the session, which concerns the various sectors and private actors working together in concert to empower the vulnerable. Um, I hope to illustrate by example some of the work that A4ISD has done showing how the work we do helps to ensure that the law is implemented, enforced and very often just m simply made known so that individuals and communities are aware of their rights, rights very often they didn't even know they had. So in this context what we do is that we work by enabling the private sector which in our case, it means international city law firms to provide pro bono, by which I mean free, legal assistance to our development partners, which comprise civil society organisations, NGOs, governments in the developing world, the UN, the World Bank, um, to name but a few. This means that the finest legal brains, or blains, which are often um, unable, um, really usually affordable, to only the rich, are now accessible to those in need. Uh, we have over 40,000 lawyers now operating in 90 countries. Our projects have impacted so far in 114 countries. And we've undertaken the equivalent of $39 million worth of work over the past seven years. Our focus is very much on the eradication of poverty and working towards the achievement of the Millennium Development Goals. We believe that good governance and the rule of law at the national and international <coughs> levels are essential to, uh, for sustained economic growth, sustainable development and the eradication of poverty. I should add that our work is not solely focused on the rule of law but also covers many aspects of law and development. But before I continue, I just want to make a couple of points with respect to the rule of law. The first thing being that the rule of law itself is a rather nebulous concept and certainly culturally subjective when it concerns the developing world. In fact, establishing what the rule of law means in its ju any jurisdiction is a process that's unique to individual cultures and reflects how power is exercised in a particular state. 
it, it also reflects the priorities of the various states and non-state bodies that hold and enact power. And importantly, particularly where development is concerned, where valuable resources are distributed and how they are. Therefore, when looking at the rule of law in different states in the developing world, there will always be a variety of different approaches that shape how the legal and governmental systems operate and the values that therefore are endorsed. Let me just turn briefly now to the issue of development. If we say that development is viewed as more than just economic growth and instead is seen as incorporating the protection of fundamental rights and the ability for in, if, of individuals to realise those rights, then surely it stands to reason that the rule of law must be central to achieving development. Now I'm going to provide three examples of projects that A4ID, A4ID has done to illustrate aspects of the rule of law. I should say that a lot of our work, although not directly focused on the rule of law, results in ensuring that the rule of law is observed in some shape or form. Uh, my first example is about the awareness of the law itself. How can people contribute and play their full ro role in society if they do not know their rights and therefore their responsibilities in communities in which they live? One of our development partners, the Society for Democratic Initiatives, which is a civil society organisation based in Sierra Leone, was concerned by the lack of knowledge amongst its people um, of the laws that may impact on them. The transition efforts following Sierra Leone's 10-year conflict included the creation of the Anti-Corruption Commission and an attempt to strengthen the Commission with the Anti-Corruption Act. This act stipulates that um, there's an accountability framework which is designed to ensure good governance. Our development partner believed that the simplification of this law combined with training of the civil society, particularly with organisations such as that were dealt with the media or other stakeholders, would create greater awareness of responsibilities and importantly promote increased transparency amongst the public officials. So lawyers from Advocates for International um, and their legal department and their partners prepared a simple guide to this act which was publisher, published together with the Anti-Corruption Commission. This was a very straightforward piece of work, it was simple and it had a very clear outcome. Now my next example concerns the skilling up of government officials, which is essential if governments are to function effectively. Again, another issue that is essential to the rule of law. The United Nations De uh, Development Programme, the UNDP, asked A4ID to provide lawyers to train officials in the government of Rwanda to help them ensure that they were suitably skilled to negotiate and draft uh, extractive sector contracts and draft public-private partnerships. A key component of the rule of law is to have sound laws and an effective civil service who are qualified to serve the public's interests. This is of particular importance in the area of natural resources, which as you know has been notoriously connected with conflict and corruption. So in this respect, the work of lawyers in Rwanda through A4ID was in part helping to ensure that the administration of the nation's resources is governed by clear regulation, robust contracts, which protects them for the benefit of the people. And for, so to my final example, and for my final example, the issue concerns natural resources, which are crucial to sustaining people and promoting peace in post-conflict countries. As we know, if not properly managed, a wealth of natural resources can result in creating more conflict and doing so can breed more corruption. Therefore, effective management of natural resources is essential to rebuilding governance and the rule of law, combating cor corruption, improving transparency and accountability, as well as sustaining socio-economic and political stability and development in post-conflict nations. One of our um, development partners, Global Witness, <coughs> approached us and has been working on this issue relating to the natural resource sector in the Democratic Republic of Congo. 
Their request to A4ID was to provide assistance in reviewing a part of the current mining code, which was then would enable them to make recommendations to the government on ways of improving the governance of mining in that country, taking into account other mining governance frameworks that they were familiar with around the world. As a result of the legal assistance provided by lawyers from A4ID, our development partner was able to produce a briefing document which reflected the opinions on important changes that should be made to the country's mining code. I'm delighted to say that currently changes are being made to the mining code by the government, and it's believed that the recommendations have also, if taken to account, will result in more transparency in mining and, hydro, and the hybrid, um, hydrocarbon industries. So to conclude in respect to your question, I hope I've provided you with an idea of the type and what the type of need is. Um, and what we're observing as far as the rule of court law is concerned in the development context. Some of the needs relate directly to the rule of law, whereas most needs are, relate very indirectly to the uh, rule of, door, of law, where NGOs actually, in, for example, are holding governments to account, exposing corruption, etc., etc. As a whole, Unequal access to legal services can mean that the rich and powerful, particularly those in or connected with governance, are not held accountable, do not submit to the rule of law, even if the theory claims otherwise. So enabling the poor and those who represent their interests to have access to lawyers can and does play a significant role in supporting the ongoing work of the rule of law. And that, dare I say it, is where A4ID comes in. <coughs> uh, thank you, Yasmin. Um, and we will come back again also to, to, to exploring the question of further how can people universally enjoy access to law so that they are able to use laws to protect and advance their interests. And while now you are sourcing lawyers in many places, but responding to probably very tiny demand, uh, the, the, uh, probably portion of the need for this type of assistance and the question of how the, those type of services can be available at the scale that there is kind of includes all people is a, is a, is a real challenge um, and it would be great to uh, discuss that question uh, um, afterwards. Uh, Faustina, uh, the BRAC is uh, the world number one anti-poverty and development non-governmental organization uh, uh, which has integrated justice uh, in, in achieving its mission uh, of eradicating poverty. Mm -hmm. how, can, you, can you tell us how important the justice being in fulfilling this mission and how economic empowerment and legal empowerment have been really critical or important in, in making the rule of law work for ordinary people? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Zaza, and thank you all for being here this afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, it's a pleasure to be talking about the experience of, of my day-to-day -day work as a human rights activist uh, and a lawyer uh, in, a, in an organization such as BRAC. Just to give you a little bit of context, um, yes, BRAC is large. At the moment, our regular staff strength is about 400,000 in Bangladesh, and uh, the legal aid and human rights program that we run is has about an access of 170 million people. But, and also the number of uh, legal aid clinics throughout the country is higher than the number of police stations in the country, which automatically means that this is an important service node for uh, citizenry or citizens in need of justice services to come to an organization such as us rather than going to a state uh, agency due to various reasons, not least because of rent seeking and other problems. Mm -hmm. However, having said that, I, I feel there's a problem in this. When an organization such as ours is providing the <coughs> services which should naturally and rightly be provided by the state. Um, 
it is also a privilege to be working in such an organization, which is primarily an anti-poverty and development organization, uh, having the, such a large canvas to be able to infuse notions of a rights-based perspective to development. And it is, we are still a long way from seeing the uh, evidence in terms of uh, you know, world-recognized empirical data, but we nevertheless have some incremental data which we see where it is not so much the economic and legal empowerment through a robust rule of law, but economic and legal empowerment towards a rule of law mm -hmm. paradigm that we see in our work. And the way the human rights and legal aid program works is within a larger context of development. And uh, Brack calls it the whole person development, starting from the point of a conception to birth to, to death. So whether it is neonatal birth assistance to uh, inoculation, to safe birth, to uh, nutrition, addressing issues of malnutrition, to adolescent development, to uh, you know, preventing early child uh, marriages, to dowry and domestic violence and you know, agricultural support, livestock rearing, et cetera, et cetera, including agricultural insurance and financial inclusion, et cetera, right up to uh, the point of uh, death. So it's a question of the whole person. So uh, most of it, uh, one of the first things I critiqued within BRAC is that if one could split all the work that we do, uh, I would say the, it is primarily the needs-based support that or a service-based support that this organization provides, which is quite a shame. And where is the uh, demand side of the equation? And that's where, over the last 20 years, the whole notion of the meshing of these two perspectives, the needs-based and the rights-based, has uh, come through. And I think it's uh, fantastic to have this kind of canvas to work in, because it provides you not only the scale, but the ability to also demonstrate impact. And we have, as I said, uh, we still do not have uh, the kind of data that we would like to be producing at such a world uh, forum. But the incremental data that we have uh, from our ultra poverty programs show that the rate at which uh, 460,000 households are graduating from ultra poverty to poverty level and then rising above the poverty level has in a large part to do with the combination of development support, which we traditionally understand to be development of support, such as financial inclusion, uh, aid packages, et cetera, together with a very determined uh, conscientization of the entitlement to those mm -hmm. services. So uh, we have seen that once we can make that shift from uh, uh, being a beneficiary to a stakeholder. Once that little shift is made, that makes a huge difference in the behavior of the recipient of these services. When the recipient then turns into a stakeholder who then starts to ask difficult questions. So for example, we then see the shift in behavior of a person who would otherwise have been pleased to have us dig a, a, a well to have arsenic-free water, now talking about the right to have clean drinking water, or having clean drinking water as a matter of right. So I think that shift is very important, and it makes all the world's difference. When we see the, the pace and the rate at which uh, households, uh, 416 multiplied by five gets you a, a bit more than a million. Uh, people moving out of extreme poverty to poverty and then above the poverty line at an annual rate. And this is just one segment of, of what we're talking about. So um, to, very briefly, just to tell you, uh, I think I'm trying to answer your question that um, the, uh, the meshing of these two approaches is what's, mm -hmm. what has really worked. And uh, the big part of this work is done by, from the human rights program, the barefoot lawyers. 
So at the moment we have about uh, 12,000 uh, active barefoot lawyers, and these are women primarily, who mostly are illiterate, have never been to school, and most of whom have been victims of some kind of violence themselves, either domestic violence or community uh, ostracization or have suffered state-based violence, who themselves have now received legal literacy and awareness courses, which is like a 14-day course that we have, where they themselves know what uh, you know, a warrant of arrest, for example, looks like. So a police officer can't just come in and, and uh, uh, run roughshod. They know what, what are the three main questions to ask if uh, a government official is trying to uh, bribe them or whatever. So these are also people who are embedded so deeply in their own communities that their community members then can then uh, knock on their doors for support or they go and provide day-to-day and door-to-door support. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, what I'm trying to say is that there are very practical mm -hmm. uh, approaches to which we are using and uh, they are beginning to show results of how financial inclusion coupled with uh, enhancement of social capital together with legal services and legal awareness can make all the world's difference in terms mm -hmm. of real person, real development. Thank you, thank you, Faustina. Uh, Vivek, uh, we don't have Simeon Koroma, unfortunately. This is yet another time, occasion. Um, he's unable to obtain visa to, 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 to travel uh, to an event. Uh, he's, uh, uh, so we are, we are going to miss him a lot at this panel. Um, uh, Simeon is a co-founder of the organization of Team Up, uh, uh, for Justice, a uh, Sierra Leonean organization which uh, Vivek Maru co-founded with Simeon 10 years ago. So I'm hoping that uh, you can cover for both uh, in, uh, in your uh, presentation, probably starting from Sierra Leone, that kind of the considerations you've had in uh, really designing a new entity, new organization to address kind of the challenges and injustices that you and Simeon uh, we're observing uh, just right after the civil war in the country in 2002, 2003. And, uh, and then uh, after spending a number of years in Sierra Leone, uh, then just two years ago you established uh, another organization <laughs> that which you're leading now uh, with, a, with a vision that legal empowerment can be a response to some of the most serious challenges uh, from poverty to corruption to injustices that people experience. Uh, so maybe you could explain uh, why this, uh, how do you see the role of legal empowerment in, in, in responding to, to those uh, intractable sometimes, uh, mm. the problems, yeah. Thank you, Zaza, for the kind introduction, thoughtful question. Thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to the hosts. Um, indeed, I, I first kind of cut my teeth or got a sense of what legal empowerment looks like in those four years of, of running with, with uh, my partner, Simi, on this community paralegal program in Sierra Leone. I mean, the story there, uh, 2003, 11 years civil war had just ended. There was a consensus that um, among the root ca causes of that civil war were maladministration of justice, arbitrariness in governance, and there was this big international process looking backward to try to have some um, criminal justice for the people who perpetrated the worst crimes during the course of the war, but forward-looking in people's day-to-day -day lives, there was sort of a question, what can we do uh, when people face injustice you know, tomorrow and the next day? And at that point, there were 100 lawyers in the country total, about 6 million people in the country, 100 lawyers total. Um, I live in DC now, there's 100 lawyers on my block in DC, I think. Um, and out of, the, out of that 100, more than 90 were in Freetown, the capital. So if you go into the provinces in the countryside, even a rich person couldn't get counsel. 
Um, and also there's a dualist legal system with a traditional system, customary system, and a formal one, which in principle are integrated under one constitution, but in practice sort of operate as parallel systems. And so it was an open question, what would basic assistance for injustice look like in that context? And the experiment that we worked on was a front line of community paralegals who are from the places where they work and are trained in basic tools like mediation, education, which Faustina mentioned, sort of uh, explaining how the system is supposed to work, what the rules are, what the procedures are, um, advocacy, community organizing. Uh, and then they're supported by a couple of lawyers who in severe cases can kind of back them up with litigation or higher level advocacy in a kind of sparing and strategic way. And it, it, we, we found that uh, indeed community paralegals of this kind are able to sort of squeeze justice out of a, a broken system uh, many times, not always. Um, and and uh, so, I, I could certainly during the discussion say more about that experience, but, but uh, most recently, a couple years ago, we started this group, Namati, to try to grow the field of legal empowerment around the world. And we're, Namati is doing two kinds of things. The first is that we are convening a kind of global network on legal empowerment. The movement is rich. I mean, there's extraordinary organizations like BRAC, like Aid for ID, some of the ones that Steve mentioned. Um, all over the place, but it's relatively disconnected and we have a lot of room to grow. I think of the um, field of public health in comparison. Uh, this, room is, this, this, this meeting is something like 600 people. The AIDS meeting every year attracts about 15,000 people. And this is probably rule of law in general and, and that meeting is AIDS in particular, which is kind of a tiny subset of of the public health field. But more important than, than annual meetings, my, my brother-in-law started a hospital in rural Nepal, really mountainous district called Acham. And when he went to start a hospital in Acham district, he had so much to go on. He wanted to have a front line of primary health care workers, which is a decent analogy for the community paralegals. And there are manuals that are tried and tested and translated into multiple languages for how primary health care workers should operate. Um, there's advice on, which, on how to deal with medical waste. There's evidence of, on what public health strategies work in a rural mountainous context. Um, there's so much to go on. And in contrast, I have seen people starting community paralegal programs, legal empowerment programs all over the place from scratch, you know, as if they were sort of inventing the wheel for the first time. And so the, the hope for the network is to um, decrease that isolation. I mean, admittedly, laws vary much more than hu the human body does across borders. And it would be dangerous to sort of simply transplant a solution from one place to the other. But we have found that despite that crucial point about diversity and context, that there's a lot that practitioners across borders have to learn from one another. Practical things, like in, in running this program in Sierra Leone, one of the things that we worked on was just a simple system for tracking cases, for having a paper record for every case that a paralegal handles, so that, which enables supervision, so that a lawyer or a lead paralegal can understand what's been tried in a case, and that's one way of ensuring kind of consistency of quality. And it also enables data collection so that you can kind of get a sense of what impact you're having in the aggregate. And that system for tracking cases has been popular in our network. Another example is in the Philippines, the paralegal organizations have managed to get recognition in labor tribunals and land rights tribunals, these sort of administrative uh, bodies that the state has set up. So the process of how the, the paralegal organizations have managed to achieve that recognition has also been of interest to other paralegal organizations who are seeking similar recognition elsewhere. Another example, there's a, there's a member of our network called Asif who's, who's worked uh, organizing uh, slum dwellers in Buenos Aires and has managed to use budget analysis in the process of social and economic rights litigation. And the, the way they brought in those budget figures and an analysis of the budget into the litigation. Another example of the kind of thing that people are thirsty for. Um, and I just wanted to, I have a, a picture, the, the network is totally, Akeem's going to help me, the network is totally open access and I invite all of you to join when you leave here today. It takes a few <laughs> minutes. This is what it looks like when you log in. 
the next slide is just a map of, there's something like 270 organizations from every region in the world that have joined so far. And out of the kind of collaboration and, and learning, what we would like to grow is a stronger international movement. And I, I would love to talk more about what I think we could achieve together if we are more organized. The second, so, so convening a network is one big thing that uh, Namathi is, is working on. And the other thing is um, sort of working with partner organizations to test innovations taking issues of global significance and trying to prove what a new legal empowerment approach might look like and using the evidence from that to uh, share with our network members around the world and also to uh, inform policy, advocate for reform. And I'll just give, if I have time, just one example of, of an innovation that we're working on. Um, which relates to citizenship rights. There are peoples, as you know, around the world who manage to, who have either by severe discrimination, it's usually a combination of discrimination and um, historic accident, that they've, they've, they've been left stateless. They don't have uh, a place where they belong. And one example is the Nubians of Kenya. Is anyone here from Kenya? No. Nope. Oh, there is someone from Kenya. So, so please uh, add detail or, or correct me. But uh, the Nubian community was brought over 100 years ago. They were recruited from Nuba in Sudan into the British military. And then after they served in the British military, left in Kenya. They were given Kibera, which is now a multi-ethnic slum outside of Nairobi. Um, and more than 100 years later to this day, the Nubians are, face a great deal of discrimination and are largely excluded from society and not thought of as Kenyan people and a big proportion of them doesn't even have ID papers. And increasingly, without ID papers, you can't get a bank loan, you can't go to university, you can't get a passport, you can't access, it's sort of a gateway to accessing any other right is having an identity as a, as a citizen. Um, and so what we are doing with a small group called the Nubian Rights Forum in Kibera is to train Nubian paralegals, people from the Nubian community, to assist fellow Nubians to um, apply for ID papers. In 2011, the African Committee on Child Rights found that indeed Nubians are citizens and there's a great deal of discrimination. And actually, Kenyan government accepted. They said, you're right. Uh, we really need to acknowledge these people as citizens. They have nowhere else to go. But the frontline practice by government officials continues to be extremely discriminatory. If, you go, if you're a Nubian and you go to get an ID paper, you actually get sent to a different line. There's a committee of elders and, and you go through a whole vetting process that other Kenyans don't go through. Um, so there's this gap between the law at the top and the practice in, in real life. And that t gap typically is what legal empowerment is about trying to close. Uh, so the paralegals are trained both in that African court, that African uh, Committee of Child Rights Decision, as well as the basic procedure, the Kenyan Constitution, which is very progressive, uh, the underlying laws. And we started in February with a week-long training. Um, and on Saturday, they went to the radio. And I was there on Monday, which was their first kind of day of work when they were accepting clients. And this Nubian Rights Forum has got this little office in Kibera. You have to kind of jump over a ditch to get into the office. 50 clients on the first day. And they, they had started going to door to door. And 50 clients on the first day, this was sort of the fastest uptake of paralegal services I have ever seen because there was so much hunger. People were like, indeed, my, you know, I've been trying for 10 years to get an ID and my cousin has the same problem. And there was sort of, office was overwhelmed, which just gives you a sense of the kind of need there is. And as of last month, there were about 400 cases so far that were brought in, and 70 of them had been resolved successfully. They had resulted in uh, identity papers. What we're doing is we're tracking the data on these efforts rigorously, so to the extent that we still get denials, we can go back to, say, the Kenyan Supreme Court uh, with proof that there's this gap between the law and principle and, and the practice. And we're trying something similar with the Bihadis of Bangladesh, which is another story of statelessness. And we are interested, it, it was just a, very much an exploratory phase of trying something similar uh, in the United States, where there's 11 and a half million people who f have lived for a long time without uh, basic access to citizenship rights. And there's a law being considered right now that would give a pathway to citizenship to that huge population. 
Um, so that's just one example of the kind of innovations we're doing. The other areas that we work on are where, where we're working on innovations are community land rights, environmental justice, accountability of essential services, which Steve made references to, you know, sort of ways that communities can make sure that health care, for example, is delivered effectively. Yeah. Um, and yeah. I'm happy to talk more during the discussion. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to all of you, uh, I already broke my promise <laughs> to the audience uh, to allow at least half of the time. We are actually one hour down <laughs> and only half hour left. So for this reason, I will actually almost not do the second part, but you know, just 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 almost like pose a question maybe to the the panelists and then immediately kind of opening the to the audience. Uh, you know, as you. Probably everyone has seen uh, in this room uh, the people here, all of us are very passionate about legal empowerment. I agree with uh, the formulation that Faustina made about the title of this session. It is really about how legal empowerment can turn the rule of law into a robust concept. That something, the, the Vivex example was excellent about uh, Nubians, uh, the, kind of their ability to claim their rights really <laughs> starts to push things and then make things uh, work. There are many challenges we, we discussed here why it has not really been re translated into a kind of a large action that can turn this type of programming, this type of work, something that, that can enable most people in all, most countries in the world really enjoy very basic service, basic service to receive legal information, to be, to be able to get some advice about how to use the laws and be able to actually have capacity to claim the rights and entitlements and then you know, to pursue uh, those um, you know, in, 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 in some ways. And uh, is this, I mean, there are a number of reasons for that. I mean, one reason that the rule of law initially was not included in MDGs was that it is impossible to measure it. So there, mm. you know, how do you track you know, the, the, the kind of indicators or targets you can create. So that was mentioned as one of those. And another one, you know, that, that what came out also from Steve's uh, presentation is this kind of a lack of integrated approach. So the people dealing, if you look at donor agencies, people dealing with economic development or accountability have nothing to do with justice programs. So it's very siloed. And so justice people work with justice, courts, you know, the <laughs> police, but, but the people in uh, economic development, growth agendas, or health, public health, and other issues have no connection. So the programs are designed without really considering the role that the justice rule for legal empowerment can have in achieving those objectives. So, so one question there is, you know, is uh, are we failing the people who <laughs> Are you know engaged in you know sub, in this work to really convince those who um, design justice programs who, or development programs, development assistance programs to globally and nationally as well. Uh, the one question, one one reason could could be that we have not been able to produce enough evidence that how it is important to make those things work. I mean, we talked about the evidence here, you know, from our own practice, but. You know, when economists produce evidence or public health officials, they show lots of numbers, you know, they show that how EVs has changed that, uh, has resulted in growth and income and GDP and other things. Are, we are not able to show this type of connections often between, you know, the, the justice work and then how it has improved the, 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 the incomes and assets and, you know, the, and or measure things like accountability and transparency. So is this the, the main, one of the main obstacles while, why there is a limited investment? That force maybe another challenge probably, rule of law is a complex thing. So we could be doing many things from court administration to what else. But so what is the most important thing when you design a justice program to focus on? So we like described this kind of a paralegal approach. So maybe in Sierra Leone and maybe in Georgia, in my country and in other places, maybe that's the best way to start the work. And then uh, maybe that's the key also to addressing some of the, or, or kind of pushing other things to, to become available that is pro, pro, proscribed by law but not provided in practice. So people being able to claim their rights. But fundamentally, when uh, kind of going back again to the Legal Empowerment Commission's report, uh, 
What it really said, in my opinion, uh, when one probably one reads uh, through the <laughs> letters and lines, is that four billion people are disempowered. And this disempowerment is often intentional. So otherwise, it's hard to explain the situation where the kind of the, the very basic thing for, for citizenship in any country, to be a citizen of your country, is ability to organize your life based on the laws and enjoy those rights that the laws provide. So you are excluded from that. You are not able, you don't know the laws. You are not able to rely on the laws. So you're not actually living in your country in some ways. You're not part of that public, on a, on a society or the state. And, uh, and, and you think of these things uh, in, a, uh, in, in terms of injustice, which is felt by everyone and everywhere in, in very sim, you know, clear and very, you know, um, as, as simple terms, and you know, and, and, and in other places, it's not just because intentionally people are excluded, but because it's not given any importance, and you know, both by those who you know uh, support this work as well as those who receive it. And uh, you know, I um, you know when uh, uh, you know we, we in, in my organization we did uh, a legal need, measuring measurement of legal needs of people in about ten countries and. Uh, for example, in Ukraine, when uh, we it's a, it's a household uh, kind of based survey and kind of gives the full picture more or less of the situation of the country, we found that at least half of the population experiences at least one justice problem every year, and half of those would never use the justice system because they do not trust in in the justice system. So they. So you actually have about a quarter of the population to just to basically start with, uh, who actually do not would not rely on a justice system to solve the problem. So they would, and this is true for probably most countries in the world. How many people do not enjoy benefit from justice uh, um, uh, because they don't trust in it or they do not know how to enjoy it? So the legal empowerment, in some ways, uh, and economic empowerment, as linked to the legal empowerment has been in some places a driving uh, element to finding some solutions. Uh, but I think uh, just overall, I think that, 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 I think that the, the justice people committed to this work or who are doing this work, probably I feel like uh, we need to do a better job to explain and to demonstrate mm -hmm. and uh, convince those uh, in other sectors as well as those who make policies um, and I believe that in this regard, the, the, the new MDG agenda is a real opportunity. If those things get on the agenda, I, I would expect there will be much stronger interest and investment in, in, in kind of a building, uh, supporting this. For example, one of the objectives, you know, the goals, or justice goals that high level panel proposed is a universal identity. So that there should not be a situation what Vivek described that you have population in a country who don't even have a birth certificate or the basic papers. So they so you know and then uh, Sir Fazal Abed, the founder of Brac and George Soros co-authored the op, op ed last year on uh, on on really calling uh, on 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 universal legal identity to be part of the. Uh, the, the, the new development agenda, um, uh, without which it's impossible to achieve the objective that they've set, that is to e eliminate extreme poverty. So one cannot do without the other. And there are a number of others. So maybe it's a good time now to, uh, I don't know if you want to comment on anything I've said, but probably maybe just open the, the, the floor for comments, questions, observations, and then uh, we'll spend the next half an hour to exchange opinions. So I already see the hand uh, over there, so please, and Second. another one. Yes. If you could, so we have mics and microphones here. Yeah. And um, Thank you very much. I found the presentations very interesting, especially the ones that deal with uh, how to provide assistance to the poor and the powerless, the representative from, I think it was Bangladesh and also Sierra, Sierra Leone, in which you talked about your experiences. I am from Guyana, South America. Mm. Um, political scientist, but I've been working with women for 42 years. I mm. will say advocate for women's rights. I am here in my capacity 
as a chairperson of the Women and Gender Equality Commission. As I left Guyana a few days ago, we were involved in a program called Access to Justice. And we were visiting all the regions of our country telling women perhaps exactly the same things about what their rights are and, and whether the police is not doing their work, whether the legal aid, aid is not reaching out to them, whether the probation and family welfare services are not doing what they're supposed to be doing. And it is revealing that when you go to the communities, what people can tell you, I assume it's the same everywhere in the world that even though their laws and their support systems and their mechanisms to help the people, people do not, are unable to access these facilities. Now, having said that, I want to ask a question. I like the opening remarks, Mr. Uh, Galoop, in, in when you stated about the law and the fact that we need to help the poor. I don't know how practical that is because the question to my mind will be, whether it's not a conflict of interest situation to expect lawyers to be the advocates for the poor and powerless. They're good lawyers and they're also lawyers that, like doctors as well, what are they trained for professionally? They're supposed to be there to do their work, ultimately to earn a living and to survive. So the question I want to ask you is this, to what extent lawyers will be able to confront their respective governments in observing a robust rule of law when very often they can face persecution. That's the first. And secondly, I want to know how the Bar Association or lawyers will be able to take up human rights issue. For example, uh, and, and challenging the status quo as well. On human rights issue, we have been hearing about female genital mutilation. We've been hearing about all these oppressive things that are done to women right around the world. And I'm asking myself, we have brilliant lawyers everywhere. How come groups of lawyers cannot challenge a status quo with respect to these negative trends in whether religion or culture or norms that seem to oppress women? And I do believe that at this forum, I want to ask that it would be something useful for the World Justice Project to perha perhaps embark on, to start looking at these, I consider them not traditional, but they're basic human rights violation. And that is something that I would like to put on the table for discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So we will take a few questions on the first round um, and then continue with the next round. So please, that you were the next and then lady in pink and then uh, Christina. Yeah, and then we'll do the next round. So that we um, thank remember you. questions. <laughs> Please. Thank you, panel, for the excellent uh, discussion. My name is Kanan Thru. I'm from India. Uh, my, I also have two questions, actually. First question is that we talked about uh, legal empowerment. So is there any measurement of who is a legally empowered person? I think, Professor, that would be a question more to you. I mean, who do you consider as somebody who's legally empowered? Um, what do you see? would be the criteria for that. Mm -hmm. um, and the second question is that uh, all of you have been working in the field of legal empowerment. Um, once you kind of are satisfied in the way certain things are moving, do you feel that even the legal machinery is also responding to that? As um, you pointed out, are the court system also changing or they are the mm -hmm. same and people continue to feel uh, as much distrust in the system as um, anybody else is who's slightly more aware? So are we changing the system as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Please. Yeah, Vivek. Yeah, it's on, please. Mm. Um, but I, it got me thinking, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what um, type of development situation is right for a parallel program and what makes it the right environment to embark on that type of mm -hmm. justice reform project. Okay, thank you. Mm. Uh, Christina? Yes. 
maybe Please if you could uh, give the mic to the, the Christina. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'm Christina Vivesheimer with the World Bank. Great presentations. It's a really good panel. Thank you very much. I would love to hear um, some of the panelists describe how, how you might see an ideal future for legal empowerment. Um, if, if to date our efforts have been relatively small scale and more isolated and you know context specific than we might like how could we imagine a, a more ideal future in the context of the world bank one thing i can imagine is that um all of our development work would have a legal empowerment aspect. There are mm. colleagues working on road projects or forestry projects mm. or health projects. Pay attention to legal mm -hmm. and justice aspects like participation, redress mechanisms, accountability. And I take your point, Zaza, that we should also be really paying attention to measuring the extent to which legal empowerment helps those projects go better. So we could, so I could imagine that as part of our ideal. But it would really help me to know, you know, how you might see a, a better world in this area so that we could sort of be trying to match up, uh, you know, what we're doing yes. with that, with that yeah. vision. So we'll take one more question in, the, in this round, and then we'll start answering. Uh, we have... Thank you very much. I'm Maya Alexandra. I'm with the Temple Tsinghua Joint LLM program in Beijing, China. Um, this has been a great panel. Thank you all so much. Um, the title of this panel is Economic and Legal Empowerment. We've talked a lot about legal empowerment, but I haven't heard much about economic empowerment. And the reason I'm asking is because uh, if you look at the historical examples of places where rule of law has arisen indigenously, through organically over hundreds of years, it always arises to protect economic rights first. And if you look at the example in the United States, uh, the Constitution grew out of the failure of the Articles of Confederation, which were designed to facilitate trade. The Constitution was considered to be entirely compatible with slavery. Mm -hmm. So legal empowerment was entirely, uh, in that example, at the service initially of economic empowerment of a particular class, specifically the disempowerment of others. And when you see the progression organically, when you give rule of law time to develop over hundreds of years, that's the progression that you see repeatedly. Now, what we're all trying to do is something that doesn't have a historical precedent, which is cultivated in the Petri dish so that it happens all at once uh, um, equitably. Um, but my own instinct about this is that uh, you're right in the title of the panel to link economic and legal empowerment for greatest effectiveness and for greatest enforcement and to make the case for the, the governments to implement. Um, and I, I didn't hear that connection happening in the discussions that happened today. So I'd, yeah. so I'd be very grateful if the panel would discuss that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we'll uh, start taking questions, uh, so doing, providing answers or responses to the questions. Steve, why don't you start with the first yeah. question yeah. maybe we had and yeah. then... Well, actually, I'll, try, I'll work backwards quickly. Um, <laughs> oh, okay. The, but I'll, I'll be very quick to try to do justice to some bit. The, the legal empowerment can be the same as economic empowerment. Um, it can yield increase in, in people's income, such as where they have better access to land and many other fields. Uh, um, you know, in terms of what we're trying to do, you know, this Petri dish, all of development is kind of trying to push forward um, processes that often take centuries. Um, uh, the one thing I'd caution against is Looking at the experience from the past in other, you know, in, in terms of how economic empowerment developed in in the West, and say that's how it it can or should or will develop in in other countries. Christina, to get to your point about, um, you know, the the ideal future, well, we'll all live happily ever after. But beyond that, um, it I think it would include, frankly, just more funding for the kind of work we've described here, which really dis which really in turn requires, among other things changes in the way development agencies work. I mean, the bank, I think, is moving in some great directions in some ways. But you know as well as I do, the bank isn't necessarily suited to fund you know, a given NGO in a given place. You're doing good research and pilot projects through, among other things, your Justice for the Poor program. But it would involve more funding. It might involve, given limited resources in the world, less funding for state institution uh, rule of law building, given limited resources. I mean, I think, and, and that involves country-specific assessments of not just what's desirable, but even 
even more importantly, what's possible. You know, often the way big development agencies work is we start with the needs assessment. The needs assessment isn't really the best way to go. It's, it's you know, because so many countries have so many needs. It's really what's a possibility, what's a potential assessment of what can be done realistically. Mm -hmm. And sometimes legal empowerment efforts can, looking towards the long term, be more feasible than the state institution building. And as a number of us has, has mentioned, integrating um, more of this law-oriented work into other development fields, which again involves some changes in the way development agencies work since they're so sectorized, so ghettoized in the way they um, operate. You know, with respect to paralegals, I think other people, will, such as Vivek, will get into that more, and I will, but the, then I want to take time up on. I would emphasize that sometimes paralegal work is country and context specific. In the Philippines, it's very sector oriented. You have paralegals focusing on land rights or environmental issues or housing rights. Um, with, in, in other countries, you know, uh, it, it, it can be more mediation oriented. It's so context specific. Um, in terms of, um, uh, I don't want to take up too much more change, so I'm sorry that I'm just going to skip to the, the, the first one. Lawyers can be part of the problem. Uh, the bar associations tend to, in many countries, tend to oppose getting, pa giving paralegals the right to work, to, to do their um, operations. Um, uh, nevertheless, I think this gets back to the point of getting getting, uh, accepting that there's a need for continued funding for this kind of work rather than this mantra of sustainability that development agencies tend to fool themselves with, saying that's just because we, the development agencies, might not be willing to provide funds, um, this work shouldn't be sustained. I'd view it in reverse. I'd say if, in fact, legal empowerment work, such as paralegal work, is important for development effectiveness, for protecting and advancing rights, and given that many countries are going to be getting aid for decades and decades, make that part of the ongoing aid agenda for many countries across the world. Yes. Faustina? Yes, thank you. Um, I, I think I'll just take two or three uh, points because it's not possible to answer mm -hmm. all of them. Um, I think one of the ways uh, from my experience of understanding when legal empowerment is working or having an impact mm. is to observe uh, the behavior of uh, certain groups or communities. And by behavior here, I particularly mean a, a healthy justice-seeking behavior. That could be active or could uh, be by implication or passive. Uh, and tying it to economic and other empowerment is when, uh, for example, a woman, I know that she is uh, empowered or more empowered, or her latent demand has been uh, latent demand for certain needs or rights have been provoked is when she starts articulating certain uh, questions, she articulates her demands, uh, she behaves differently with her family, she takes part in decision making, her children are inoculized, uh, inoculated, and um, you know, she resists certain issues including domestic violence. She participates in uh, service, access to service issues, etc. So there are various ways in which one can look at the behavior change. It doesn't have to necessarily fit within a justice uh, framework. Um, whether she is demanding information on where the nearest rationing point is, is also, I think, uh, a sense of entitlement that is pushing her towards achieving an economic uh, uh, service uh, or a financial inclusion service, etc. Now, as to what the future would look like, I mean, I could draw a, a rosy picture, but I think I would. Uh, pinpoint a, a word of caution as to what I would not like to see more of in the future, which is where states, as I have seen in, in, in our example, where states continue to abdicate the responsibility towards the poor in the justice sector by relying more and more on paralegals or non-government organizations or, or uh, justice delivery services 
out of the uh, uh, non, non state justice delivery mm -hmm. services to provide what is rightfully the duty of the state. So, and then you know, investing more and more on mercantile and commercial courts or uh, other courts. So I think that is something we must be very aware of, uh, Christina, in the, in the future as to what we should not uh, do or be aware of. And in terms of economic and social uh, empowerment uh, together with legal, I think th we have arrived, I think, at a global moment where we can forcefully talk about uh, marrying all of these together. And we have hopefully come a long way beyond 1966, et cetera, where there was you know, the classical example of the uh, segregation or classification or stratification of rights and needs, needs uh, rights after needs, et cetera. And even within rights, there are certain classifications. I think we have been able to make the case that uh, we are no more you know, in the form of a ladder but uh, more in the, uh, a circular form, if we're talking about circular rights and circular needs. So we've, we should be talking more of a circular motion rather than uh, prerogative of certain needs and certain rights above others. Yes. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. Um, just very briefly, uh, we've been talking about economic, social, legal empowerment. Um, one thing to, to bear in mind, I think, in all of this is um, if it's to have any effect, it has to be meaningful to the grassroots. And for the grassroots, trying to make any difference is going to be so very difficult because we're talking about people probably who are experiencing extreme poverty where their, what is meaningful to them, what's important to them is survival, the next meal, not about rights, not about where they, where, um, they intend to go in terms of um, acknowledging how they're going to um, deal with things in their, uh, their daily lives. So it's, I think it's just trying to keep, keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vivek. Great questions. Um, interesting discussion. Uh, I'll just take three of them. I'll start with the one about in what circumstances do paralegals make sense? And I'll kind of take up the point, the interesting point that Faustina made. Um, it's true, Some, Nigeria, Brazil are also examples of places where it has to do with the political economy of, the, of legal education, but there's a total surplus of lawyers. That though, for me, isn't a signal that uh, paralegals don't make sense, because even if there's tons of unemployed lawyers, that doesn't necessarily mean that the, the, the legal services are being provided adequately to the poor, and in fact, in both those places, uh, there, there's a huge gap. And we're just trying to get across the finish line this six country study of community paralegal programs, the impact across different, six different countries. And one of the main findings uh, out of the study, and this speaks to Faustina's point, is that we see the most, some of the greatest impact when paralegals deal with holding state institutions accountable and holding private firms accountable. Where those imbalances of power are greatest, paralegals can have the most impact. If they are integrated into a network and they have supervision and support, the possibility of litigation when push comes to shove. And on the other hand, to the extent that they deal with intra-community disputes, like things that you know, two neighbors have a problem and mediating the problem, um, we find that that sort of work makes the most sense when the existing institutions are systematically failing people. So if there's a gender bias and women can't access, let's say, property rights, then it makes sense for paralegals to deal with local intra-community disputes regarding women's access to land. Mm -hmm. So, so Faustina, just to respond, I mean, I don't think of community paralegals as they shouldn't be substituting for state institutions, rather they should be making state institutions work for people. Yes. It's that bridge quality uh, that, that's crucial. Um, and then, I, Christina, I love the question about uh, what would the future look like? I'll just give three big dreams. Um, one is we should have a multilateral financing mechanism for legal empowerment. And this, this speaks to Steve's point. You know, the, the Global Fund for AID, AIDS, TB, and Malaria is just one example, but this is a Global public good, you know, and, uh, it, it, Martin Luther King said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice anywhere, um, everywhere, sorry, injustice anywhere is a threat to, threat to justice everywhere, and even more than public health, 
um, there's kind of a natural disincentive for governments to invest in legal empowerment within their borders because it does hold states accountable. So that's all the more reason for multilateral partnership on investing in legal empowerment. And I would argue that a multilateral financing mechanism should be reciprocal. It should be rich countries, poor countries alike accepting investments because legal empowerment is necessary everywhere but you would kind of tailor those investments by the level of need and maybe the rule of law index could be one way of doing the tailoring. So global fund for legal empowerment, that's one, one dream. Second one is every nation should be thinking about how to provide legal aid at scale. Mm. Um, if even in the poorest of countries, the Minister of Health when they wake up on their first day at work, they have to answer the question, how am I gonna get health services to the whole country, to everyone? And I need to come up with a sort of vertical structure. Usually there's primary healthcare workers involved, but they have to try to answer the question. In most countries, no one's even asking that question on legal aid. It's ad hoc, there's a little bit in the capital, a little bit spread out. There's, there's a sometimes specific constitutional requirements regarding defense against capital crimes, but that's a tiny swath of people's justice problems. So having, you know, at, in, at every nation should be confronting, there should be someone, a legal aid board perhaps, that's confronting the question of how do we deliver legal aid at scale for the whole range of problems that people face. And then a third last dream, which is really actually a whole bunch of dreams, is that th there's a whole range of policies re that, that enable legal empowerment. Just one example is RTI, and, and, and there's been a lot of progress on right to information le legislation around the world, at least getting the laws passed. Implementation is another question. Another example is r community rights over land and natural resources. This is crucial for the work that we do. But, but there's a whole sort of policy agenda for making governments responsive uh, that allows legal empowerment to flourish. And I, I love your idea, Christina, about making sure that development efforts across every sector incorporate a legal empowerment perspective. Uh, the, the, the last question that I'll, I'll um, speak to is the one about measuring, which I do think is crucial. And Zaza, you, you made reference to this, that to build the movement, one of the things we need is a stronger body of evidence. Um, there's more evidence than many people think. We, we're just completing a review of all evidence that we can find on legal empowerment. 224 studies are, are in our review, which that, that quantity surprised us. We're being pretty inclusive in terms of what sorts of methods we, we um, uh, include in our review, but, but, but there's a serious quantity of studies, and if anyone's interested in the first draft, I can send you final draft that will be out in a few months. But we divide impact into two things, citizens and consciousness on the one hand, and institutions on the other hand. And it sort of maps on, Nomothi's vision is responsive governments, empowered citizens, or empowered citizens, responsive governments. And you can think about the impacts in those same two categories. And on the citizens and consciousness side, the kinds of things, and, and Faustina mentioned this as well, that you would look for to measure legal empowerment. One is, has knowledge of the law gone up? Um, has a willingness to take action, to exercise a right? Has, has there, is there a change in that willingness? Thirdly, does someone actually demonstrate actual action? And fourthly, can you obtain a remedy? When, can you obtain a remedy to a breach of a right? And in our evidence review, we find pieces of evidence uh, showing all four of those types of impact on citizens and consciousness. On the institution side, you know, uh, are, are governments more responsive to citizen engagement? Is there genuine space for participation? And there are a whole range of ways of measuring that. And the evidence in our review is thinner on that front, uh, partially because there are genuine kind of methodological challenges, and partially because that's, I think, one of the ways in which the field needs to grow, is to show more how these grassroots efforts actually add up to reform and to change of government institutions. Yeah. But uh, thank you guys for, uh, for listening. Thank you. Uh, so for investing in uh, legal empowerment is investing in social capital, mm. in a way. And that's what really, I mean, has not been when, when development assistance focuses on education, microcredit, health, and other things. That really, dri that conviction drives that process. For some reason, the strong case has not been made in for legal empowerment being an essential component of active citizen social capital. I, uh, my dream, which I, I, I share your dreams, mm. uh, and um, I, um, I love this 
quote from the mission statement by the Community Law Center Network of Ontario. In, uh, this is the network of 79 independent uh, legal aid uh, community law centers, which are publicly funded so through the legal aid board from the federal government. And here is their mission statement. The community <coughs> legal centers in Ontario across the province are helping to build a fair and equitable society by protecting rights of low-income Ontarians. They serve the most vulnerable in society in those legal areas most critical to low income, like access to housing, education, health care, income protection, and pensions, just to name few. Beyond the representation, the clinic staff composed of lawyers, paralegals, and community workers educate low income clients about their rights, engage in law reform and community development, and step beyond traditional lawyer client model to achieve change that affects the entire low income community. I think more or less that is what is the mm. mission of TMAP mm. through its paralegal work. That is what other organizations do around the globe in Ukraine where I work on a very similar work uh, or Indonesia or elsewhere. Uh, but this work cannot be achieved, I believe, without what you say, the global fund mm. that supports innovations of the kind and the recognition that in Sierra Leone, for example, when uh, I, we, we did a with Vivek very rough calculation of how much it would cost to have one paralegal per chiefdom to provide very basic legal empowerment services. So you could, in principle, in the, in the entire country, have really give the basic notion to justice for m many people by spending about $2 million hmm. so in Sierra Leone. So, so in any, any donor or assistance program to Sierra, in Sierra Leone which spends billions on assistance work should, should find that $2 million a year to hmm. invest in this work. Without that, uh, you know, it's very hard uh, to, to achieve, even to get closer to the, to the, to the, to the very basic and a kind of a notion of what rule of law and legal empowerment, what we're talking about. So time, we are just five minutes past the allocated time for this panel. So thank you very much. I would like to thank our panelists and thank all of you for your active participation. And we can definitely continue discussion after mm. the session as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.